Hi everyone, welcome back to Civil War Monitors Behind the Lines. I'm your host, David Thompson. Today I'm joined by Dr. Timothy Wesley, who is a lecturer in History and Religious Studies at Penn State University, as well as an affiliate of the Richards Civil War Era Center. And today we are going to talk about Dr. Wesley's latest work, The Politics of Faith During the Civil War, now out with LSU Press. So Dr. Wesley, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me, David. Uh, if you don't mind, a, a really fascinating read, something I think a lot of people don't think about in the Civil War, and certainly the politics of the war, is actually really bringing this religion in. So if mm. you could perhaps just start us off with a little bit of an overview of, of what this is really about. It is a look at the um, political participation, or lack thereof, of denominational ministers on the home front during the Civil War. What ministers imagined for themselves uh, as uh, their political role, um, how they uh, um, assumed uh, a political um, um, stance in their pulpit or refused to, and what consequences they faced when they refused to assume those political stances in their pulpit. Um, a political activism that the, the, uh, the wartime public increasingly expected of them. So in a real sense, the book um, looks at the cross-currents of politics and religion during the war through a uh, particular lens, that of the... Um, the uh, home front denominational preacher. Now, when we're dealing with these northern preachers, as you mentioned, as we get into the war itself, um, you allude to in the book that there's a few different paths, I guess, that, that people take uh, in their various congregations, depending on their level of patriotism or they, what they believe to be the perceived role of the church as it pertains to what's going on with the state and, and, and current events. I wonder if you could perhaps touch on that a little bit. Sure. Um, um, and I'm glad that you put the question not in the, in the, in the terms of like war, pro-war, anti-war, because really that's not the consideration at hand in the book. Um, because um, as I make clear in the book, I'm dealing with those in mainstream denominations, not in the pietist sects or the peace churches who are ideologically against war in all its uh, forms. These are men, many of them, who are as appropriately unionist and loyal um, as the next public citizen, but in their ministry are averse to bringing some of them um, um, politics into religion. And I, I do uh, stake out three camps in which these men um, um, can be placed using the terminology of the period largely. The first is separate spheres. This idea of spheres is very pronounced in mid-19th century American life. And the idea there is that, um, you know, um, there is no place in the pulpit for the consideration of political concerns, no matter what they were, no matter how pressing, even war. Sort of um, um, uh, the idea that, um, you know, east is east and west is west and all that, and never the twain shall meet, as I um, uh, may have mentioned. So the idea that a preacher, no matter how his public sentiments ran, um, uh, no matter how appropriately unionist or loyal or patriotic he might be in his heart, when he ascended, you know, the pulpit, he was to deal with religious considerations only. The, the faith walk, the degree to which um, congregants were, you know, in the light of Christ and raising godly families and all those kinds of things. So they were separate spheres. And, of course, they were not ready to meet the... Um, demands of an, uh, of an expected public, and sometimes they had to deal with the consequences. Secondly, then, is a category I call separate duty. They saw um, um, politics as being important to every individual, and uh, they believed they had a duty to instruct um, their um, listeners in certain ways, but I, I talk about it in, in terms of degrees. They believed that it was the minister's role to um, inspire um, um, congregants to do things um, in the light of Christianity that were appropriate, but not to deal with specifics. And when they dealt with specifics, then they broached um, um, political subjects, as they imagined it, and were unduly political in so doing. So they might, for instance, um, um, offer up some prayer for the uh, union effort per se, but to then um, pray for this particular campaign or this particular leader or this particular uh, tactic or policy was becoming unduly specific. They may pray um, for um, the salvation of, of the, um, uh, of the uh, slave owner, 
but then to advocate policies relative to slavery um, went too far. So it was one of degree. So they imagined that um, politics was not altogether divorced from their role or from their um, obligations as a clergyman, but they were in two different categories of duties. So you had separate spheres, never let them touch. Separate duty, you know, it's a different kind of consideration, uh, one in which sort of degrees are very important. And then finally, of course, the one that I think most people are familiar with, these um, ministers like um, Beecher and others, who imagine really no difference. Anything that has to do with the edification of the uh, Christian in the pew was um, fruit um, for the pulpit. And so um, I call those um, ministers separate component uh, ministers because they do see that it is a separate component, um, at least here on earth, of their obligations as ministers dealing with the war and slavery and politics and the like, and those things that are much more expressly biblical and theological and the like. But they're separate components of a common ministry, of one ministry. So you, it's really just, a, if you'd imagine a continuum, that's what it is. It's an ideological con continuum that leads from conservatism, religious conservatism, to those like Beecher who um, say really the idea of political preaching in and of itself is a construct, a red herring really, to distract from um, um, what should be the focus of every true Christian, preacher or not, the war. Now, when you deal with some of those preachers that perhaps aren't deemed patriotic enough, uh -huh. um, what what involvement, I guess, what role then would the government, the union, have stepping in on these ministers? What did they actually do? Well, that's a good question, and really that's what I think marks this period as one in which you have the first concerted society-wide sort of campaign to check the rhetorical, um, absolute rhetorical freedom of the pulpit. Because although you had a certain turns in American uh, history before where certain groups of ministers come under a close scrutiny, um, congregationalists, you know, around the War of 1812 in New England, like you'd never had anything like you see during the war. And that speaks to your question. It has to do with loyalty oaths, certainly, um, with arrests. And, you know, we know of arrests by provost and the like in the border regions, but there were arrests that take place in, you know, Buffalo, New York and and, and, and Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, and really all over the North for preaching pacifism or resistance to the draft and the like, those kind of things. So there are, first and foremost, arrests. There is denominational um, uh, scrutiny and, and censorship and, and really banishment. There is, uh, in a more immediate way, local scrutiny that can include violence, certainly. Uh, and, and then just sort of the public... Um, scorn that made a minister's life in his local community um, very difficult. There, so you have um, really lots of you know um, lots of elements coming from public reprobation all the way up to being arrested and incarcerated um, um, that weigh on those ministers who resisted as they saw it again the politicization of their pulpit. Um, um, Collectively, I think it, it really does um, um, constitute a society-wide campaign in which um, local citizens who really may not even be involved in the local church still know what's going on in the church and bring um, a lot of scrutiny um, um, uh, in looking at local ministers. Denominations, hierarchies, managing um, or, or um, 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 those assemblies that uh, issue public or excuse me, church policy, um, all the way up to local officials, state officials, and ultimately national officials. Now, shifting, I guess, a little bit further south, we've alluded to the border states, and, and that's going to be obviously a focus here. When you deal with Confederate ministers, or I sh should say those who become Confederate uh, uh -huh. ministers um, once the war begins, uh, it's a slightly different experience um, during the late antebellum period sure. uh, than their northern counterparts. And I, I wonder if you could touch on that just a little bit. Well, yeah, what I point out in the book is that even though southern preachers, those preachers who would ultimately become Confederate preachers, have been really um, 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 proffering a kind of, uh, of a unique white Southern slavocratic 
society for a long time. They've effectively um, rendered slavery uh, as a part of the domestic sphere, and so they don't consider it to be political preaching when they venerate all things related to slavery in the old South. At the same time, you know, what you were talking about, those developments as northern preachers are engaged in this debate, this late antebellum debate about political preachers, those same southern preachers then indict northern clerics for being unduly political and bringing about really the rupture of the country and being um, really unchristian in so doing. So what I say is then when the war starts, it's very easy for that message to kind of get twisted a little bit, just a little bit, and become, um, um, you know, those same preachers now become the chief arbiters of Confederate nationalism, creating, you know, support for the Confederacy, because instead of now just being... Um, um, the main source of justification and defense for that slavery privileging society, um, you know, now they have an actual government that is the um, um, manifestation of that society. And so they uh, make fealty to that government, support of that government, a part of the Christian obligation of every true Southern. Um, it is, however, as I point out sort of along the way, it's hard to uh, distill what is the real influence of the Southern clergy um, in terms of its formative power because they're so often dancing to a tune that's called by somebody else, be it the, the slave owner, the, the planter elite in the Old South or uh, in the after uh, war period um, that I get to in the epilogue, you know, the forces of the quote-unquote New South, but ultimately um, Jim Crow and the like. But that's what I mean. They, they, um, the Southern clergy um, become arbiters of Confederate nationalism in a very important way. And I think you you bring in as well. Obviously, we're not necessarily dealing with, say, a preacher in the Deep South. But once the Union Army and, by association, kind of the Union government's tentacles kind of move in on some of these areas in the Upper South, and as the war progresses more and more Confederate territory, then they have to contend perhaps not only with a congregation who they want to um, step step in line with, but then they have to try and find a balancing act uh, dealing right. with a uh, the enemy. That's right. And they come up with novel, inventive ways, really, to continue to foment um, defiance for federal occupation. And I quote um, a general in the book who, who, who uh, essentially says that these preachers are worth a Confederate regiment because of the of the influence that they have, the continued resistance that they proffer by really because of what I said a minute ago, because the way they see this new government as being sort of a sacred entity, the embodiment, the manifestation of a, of a sacralized society, of a God-blessed society, then to them the church is perfectly appropriate as a place of resistance, a nexus of resistance. And then when they can't offer um, um, direct oversight of, this, of that resistance for the reasons you've talked about, um, even then they continue um, um, in, in covert ways very often to foment resistance and defiance. And if not, um, 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 you know, in a, some sort of conversation with members, the messages that they have long preached fuel that defiance in Southerners under federal occupation. And, and, and finally, Tim, I wonder if we could possibly touch on just a little bit the, the black church experience, sure. uh, which, which you draw on in this book. And I think it's it's an important um, element into the equation, I would say, certainly once we start to deal with issues of emancipation. Well, um, what I wanted to do uh, in talking about the black church, you know, um, one of the themes of the book is that preachers, denominational preachers, do not all of a sudden just sort of abandon any kind of of um, intellectual independence by virtue of the war or by their affiliation with denominations. They continue to be thinking people and making their own decisions, and, and they're not um, cheerleaders blindly sort of supporting um, some force or the other. And that gives them agency, of course. And I wanted um, one of the things I wanted to do in looking at the black church during the war was to show that that was true there too, even though obviously there were issues of, 
of almost universal importance throughout the African American spiritual community, there was still a degree of intellectual independence. They disagreed, preachers, um, about the degree to which, for instance, black um, men should run to the enlistment offices. Um, there were debates about um, the appropriateness, really, of the treatment that black soldiers were being offered and how that should be parsed out. A minority opinion, but certainly the fact that that argument's still there is important. The same true about, uh, is true about colonization, even after the war starts. So one of the things I wanted to do was to show that ideological independence, that it still continued in black and white uh, ministers throughout the war. And, of course, um, the other thing that I wanted to do um, was talk about the role that black preachers played in readying, as they saw it, African Americans for what would be ultimately the fruits of the Civil War, um, freedom, redemption as a people. Um, and so I deal with that through um, um, the AME ministry predominantly because that's the church, I think, tradition that's most associated with African American independent politics during the period. And I show those ministers as being invested in this campaign to ready African Americans for freedom through um, paying particular attention to, um, for lack of a better term, moral improvement and then education. And then in looking at moral improvement, I um, uh, uplift, if you will. I assign that then to um, African American church leaders. And, uh, of course, the argument in doing so then is that it's not just a reactionary response to Jim Crow later on in the century, that it's not something that's sort of class defined um, by African-American leaders later in the century um, to appeal to um, the good graces of whites, that it's um, organic and that it comes um, almost independent, um, providentially independent of concern for white thought from these African-American ministers during the war. And so uh, in all of this, what I'm doing and in, 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 in talking about the degree to which black preachers um, tried to uh, ready African-Americans for freedom and emancipation and political participation and in showing them that degree of uh, ideological independence, it, um, it um, underscores really, in me anyway, an appreciation for um, the ideological um, rigor and and weight of these of these men and their um, independence. If that answers the question, I, I believe it does, Tim. I believe it does. Well, Tim, thanks so much for taking a little bit of time out of your day to talk about your new book. Again, it's the politics of fate during the Civil War, out with LSU Press. I think it's a great book for people to pick up who want to look at issues of religion, issues of civil liberty um, during the war, both North and South. And I think it's a very it's a complicated story um, and. As Tim has mentioned, some of it's been out there before, but I particularly think Tim um, hones in on a couple of points here that are well worth exploration for people who are interested in the war, because the war certainly extended beyond that battlefield, uh, and religious preachers uh, and the like were very, very influential, and the government recognized it as such. So, Tim, thanks so much for joining us today, and hopefully we can have you on again in the future. Oh, thanks, David. Appreciate it. It was fun.